All right, welcome to another Regen Civic session. Uh, today we're going to continue diving into the organization co-creation process and what that looks like, getting the artifact of the game guide or whatever projects you choose to call it, but essentially the guide for how to contribute to your project, what that looks like, how the rules of engagement work and all that fun stuff. So again, if the analogy is, is we're playing new games together, which is what we're really doing, humans coming together to coordinate. The first step you do when you play a new game is you pull out that guide and you say, how do, what is this game called? How do the pieces work? How do I play? Right, so that's the first artifact we wanna create as projects here. And that's what we're gonna continue with today. Uh, before I dive in, I'm gonna do a small presentation of Region Civics guide. So I just forked the, the template I talked to you guys all about, made it for Region Civics. And I can do a little overview of that to help inspire or give new ideas or help ground some of the stuff we've been talking about lately. Um, then after that, we can have a discussion about the guide process in general. Any other groups can talk about what they've created so far, any questions you have, anything related to the guide process. Then after that, we can decide where we want to go next in today's session. One other route we have available to us is to go right into the DAO process. And I could show the region civics DAO and actually what it looks like to be part of that, making these initial proposals and walking through it. So if groups are like, yep, we're ready to launch our token, we want to get going on that now, then I can show you one way that you'd be able to do that now. Um, if you have any ideas of anything else you'd really want to cover today, just feel free to put them in the chat and we can make this a co-creative process as we design our space together here. So before we dive in today, does anyone have any announcements they want to bring related to your alliance or anything related to region civics? Yeah, maybe one. Uh response is um, that we took a look at the email that was sent to us uh, today or yesterday to take a look at the, yeah how we could continue if groups want to continue asking questions um, in what way and how we can improve so we we responded to it i think jillian harvey sent an email back so that's, that's coming towards you Yes, um, so as you can see, a lot of the projects are here on this call. Um, for some, that's a, a conflict of time. For others, it might not see, um, there might be a diversity of reasons and that's what the email is meant to explore. So please respond to that if you're one of the 13 projects about how we can best design this space to serve you. Um, if we don't hear from you as one of the projects, we'll assume that for whatever reason you've dropped off for this season and then we'll open that spot up to some of the other projects who want to fill it. So we do have a kind of a waiting list of other projects wanting to step in. So we would be able to offer them that space to make sure we have a full cohort of 13 projects participating. Um, so yeah, that's what the email is for, is to help get us more information and to pick a different time. So I realize this time zone isn't the most ideal. So we have a way of going in there and picking a new time for these sessions. Um, Walter, did that email come to you? I didn't, I just, I didn't see it. If you didn't get it, just reach out to Will on Discord and then you can give him your email and send it to him because Will's kind of oversaw that. I was gonna give him space to speak to it, but I'll let him do that at the end of this call when he comes back on screen. Um, any other announcements before we kick it off? Or thoughts or questions? Uh, yeah, hi everyone. Hi everyone. Um, we, a few of us have a uh, Gitcoin grant round 14 uh, pages going, raises going, and um, we're thinking of running a Twitter space tomorrow evening. There's a few here, so uh, Traditional Dream Factory, um, some people doing stuff about CLT's Cohere Network. We're looking to try and uh, raise a few more voices into that space. So that's tomorrow, 6.30 Portuguese time, 7.30 European time. Um, I'll fail to remember all the other time zones. Uh, you accidentally muted yourself. Thanks. I'll put the uh, the link in the chat and I'll put it also in Discord as well. Awesome. Thanks, Charlie. Uh, Tina, did you have something? Yeah, I have a I have one that just got through the process and is live too. So how do we how do we uh, participate with that lovely broadcasting you're going to do, Charlie? <clears throat> simply being there simply being there yeah and, and uh, sharing your voice so we were just going to do it quickly so just 30 minutes 
uh, it could it could roll on, but we were going to focus on showcasing four projects, four land-based projects, um, and then have some time for questions afterwards. But we didn't want it to roll on and on because these spaces can do with people making statements and, and other questions. So come along and say something at the uh, and talk about the project for a couple of minutes. Um, but most of it's because the Gitcoin grant round closes on Thursday. So we're just trying to draw a bit more attention to the land-based projects that are trying to raise on that space. And if you are, let me know, because then come and uh, I'll share your page and, uh, and highlight your project for a couple of minutes. In fact, Lala Gardens have, so um, I've already seen it. So let's connect on that, yeah. <laughs> Um, with Gitcoin, we're wanting to create more with the Gitcoin community as well. So I've got a call slated with Kevin Owaki, the founder of Gitcoin Grants and kind of who runs and stewards the whole project, um, to go on his podcast to talk about Regen Civics. And then I want the 13 projects for this round. I'll speak to that and share about everything we're doing here. And then we can share that video and start, you know, building awareness and attention for what we're building here. Uh, but I definitely think each one of our projects getting up a Gitcoin grant each round and each season is 100% what we ought to be doing. Um, and then I want to talk with Kevin, so I'm going to bring this up in the, in the podcast, about doing a separate section specifically for regenerative land-based projects and, you know, what we're doing here to have that be one of the themes in Gitcoins going forward. Um, so anyway, we'll see how that all rolls. Any other announcements or thoughts before we dive in today? All right, then if there's nothing, let me share the link for what we have for today. Just a space for everyone to pause and breathe. All right, feel free to open that one up. This is a template of how we can create the guides for our projects. And of course we can run off anything here. We don't have to follow this one if it's not right for you, but it's to help, help ground a little bit more the complexity of what I've been asking from all of you these last couple of weeks. Um, so let me go over this just real briefly what this guide does. So again, this guide is like you show up to a new game, you open it up, how do you play the game? So there's two major types of slides. One is an agreement. So this is when new members are showing up to your project. This is the slides that they know that this is what I'm agreeing to. When I'm showing up to the space, these are the main agreements, the fundamental agreements of how we collaborate and get things done. Uh, the definition slides are just the really important information that is needed to be defined in order to understand the game, of course. So for example, this slide itself is a definition slide. It's providing information. And then you see at the bottom left of each slide if they're a definition slide or an agreement. So the agreement slides are meant to that if you're having you know, any type of tension or conflict in the community, you should be able to look back at one of these agreement slides and say, actually, you know, if you guys are debating between A and B of how we make decisions, we've agreed that we actually do it A. And this is how the guide itself will evolve. As the community runs into these tension points, that's how evolution happens, is they'll be like, ooh, we actually need a new agreement here. And then after the community has decided what that agreement ought to be, they can put it back into their guide and update it accordingly, right? Um, the idea is that the guide doesn't get too long. This one is 22 slides. I recommend it around that 20 mark so that people actually have the time to be able to go through, understand it, and it doesn't overwhelm them, right? So that's what we've tried to accomplish here. So there's some first questions that we've been going over. So these are the first questions that people might ask as they're showing up to a project. You know, what is the purpose? What are we creating here? So that will be the first slide here that goes over that. So each one of these, you can click them and you can go to the slide where they're relevant, right? Which is just the next slides. Um, so first one, let me just dive into that one then, is what are we creating? So for Regen Civics, we made a video. I highly recommend that everyone's doing their video, which is what we've done with the five minute videos. So this is a perfect place for that five minute video to show up. This is the vision, this is where we're headed, this is kind of our North Star, right? Um, then the vision and values. Sorry, I lied. This is the overview video unique to this. Also, this is, in the, this is an artifact we'll create at the end of the incubator program. So after you've gone through and you've decided how your community works, how people can participate, what the project actually looks like, all of that stuff, then each project can make their own overview video. It'll be about an hour long. 
that any new member who's like, yep, I want to show up. This is what I want to participate in. They watch this video and they should have that core foundational understanding to, you know, be a contributing member of your community. Um, so anyway, here's Regen Civics taking an example of that. Okay, then this is where your five minute videos will be, which is your vision, values, and your purpose. So what are you co-creating? Uh, Regen Civics doesn't have one. It'll actually just update it to the 13 projects ones here for every season. Uh, which also explains a little bit about what Region Civics does. So I'll be making that video in the next couple of weeks. So this is just a real quick overview of what we're doing with Region Civics. So each one of your projects will share it here. Then there's the how do we co-create. So we've shared a little bit more about how we do it. And this is a little bit more what the handbook. So that really long guide that's maybe like 70 pages. This is what projects could create for really getting into details of how they co-create together. So as you find different patterns that are right for your community of how you guys are creating together, um, this is what the handbook is really designed to do. So this is gonna grow and it might actually again be like a 70 page document for each project and that's fine. So this is for the people who are the real core committed, you know, members of your community who are contributing regularly for you to be able to define what that actually means. But we have a really simple process here in Region Civics for creating is first is Come to the Region 6 Discord and participate. So share, learn, grow there together. Oops. You know, join the weekly sessions, these sessions here, and participate and participate in the breakout sessions. Uh, we use similar tools. So all the tools throughout the Web3 space that we're using so that we can adapt and learn together and duplicate, et cetera. So that's one of our patterns of creation is if we're using similar tools, then we can learn from each other more effectively. And then following our personal commitments, which is a separate slide altogether. So you can link to that slide and you can see what we're committing to as members of Region Civics and as of your projects. Then there's the membership criteria. And this is where those like holons come in. You can show the different bounds and boundaries for membership in your project. So here's Region Civics, it's got that core. So different working groups of people who are actually moving the Region Civics project forward. So myself, I'm facilitating the Region Civics incubator. I would be part of the membership here as the core contributors, right? And then right out from that is the Alliance organizations. And each one of these is gonna have a representative that's part of the Region Civics organization. And then the projects themselves that also have a representative. And then the global community of people who have signed up for our uh, newsletter, who wanna get involved, people who are participating in the festivals themselves and getting involved in any capacity right there. So that's kind of the membership of Region Civics and what it looks like, different bounds. And then what you're gonna do as a project is define this exact same thing. What different boundaries do we have for membership? And what does it mean to be part of one boundary versus another? So this is what we've done here. Um, and we've talked a little bit more about it, what it means to be a member. And then there's specific slides that really get into what membership means, how members are uh, compensated, what member duties are, et cetera. And we'll go over those shortly. So the next slide is the conflict evolution process. So we don't have one for Region Civics yet because we're gonna create one. And there's a lot of good ideas being shared right now in the Region Civics Discord, which let me just do it like this. And you can participate in creating our conflict evolution process. So once we have one, we'll define it here. And I'm sure similar communities will follow suit. Um, initial roles. So this is the initial organization structure of your community. And this is just a basic model over here. It doesn't show region civics because we're still new. We haven't formed ours yet. So we'll be forming ours when you as your project will be forming yours. Um, but this is where you're gonna show the organization structure of your project. So if you're a land-based project, maybe you have a circle for food and this circle is responsible for growing food, feeding members, whatever. Maybe you have a circle for housing, maybe you have one for storytelling, et cetera. So this is where the structure of your organization is gonna exist to show members where they might wanna fit in. Um, also, you can be able to click here and it'll send you to your DAO, whatever DAO tools you're using. So if you're using Haifa, you can send it right to Haifa. And this is when you're gonna be able to come in and see the different archetypes, roles, role assignments, and find the different quests, et cetera, that are available for contributors. Right now, Region Civics is brand new, so it's empty. You don't see anything, but this is where you're gonna be able to link your DAO so people can contribute and fill some quests and do all that stuff. Keep going, so this is a governance process. This is where we're gonna get into a lot of detail in this um, incubator, I imagine. This talks about how decisions are made and how do you evolve as a project. 
So representatives from each project. And so each alliance member, each organization, each project that's represented and the core working group are all gonna earn our voice. So it's the region of voice token. And that is used for making decisions. And you can learn a little bit more about how that all works by clicking on each one of these slides, which we'll get to again later. So this just talks about the general overview of how it works. So here's personal commitment for Regen Civics. So again, every project is gonna have your own. This is an agreement. So when members are showing up, you're saying you're agreeing to these values in our community. Um, you don't have to have one of these if you wanna leave it open. But again, I think it's really helpful to have something here that you can point back to. If there's a tension or a problem, you could say, hey, you know, we talked about radical transparency. I know that's new here, but you guys are in a working group that's secret and you're not sharing your information and we're finding that problematic, but we've agreed to radical transparency. So, you know, we talk about having all of our working groups working open or whatever. So that's where this is gonna really come in handy. So every project can have their agreements for what it means to show up and contribute to that project. All right, so these are the member duties. This is when you're gonna put in what, again, is expected of you when you're a member of the organization. So we talk about these things, but you can evolve on this if you want. Um, yeah, I don't have the time or I'm not gonna take the time rather to dive into this anymore, but you get the general idea. If you have any questions, ask in Discord, of course. Uh, member compensation. So this talks about how are you gonna be reciprocated for contributing to this project? And this is also agreement. So it talks about what you're gonna agree to in order to get that compensation. And you can again copy or delete or whatever you want from this. Um, this talks about a definition of what is a role in circle. So for those who are not familiar with holacracy, soloceocracy, or this style of organizing, uh, this just talks about the basic structure of how these things work. So every role and every circle, first, the role is not the soul. So the role is not the person. The role and circle both belong to the organization. And then each role and circle has a purpose, why it exists where it exists. So if it's a role, it's going to exist in a circle. If it's a circle, it's going to say what circle it is. Maybe it's a circle within a circle, and that can go on infinitely. So this is how organizations scale as they scale holonically by holons within holons. So, you know, circles within circles as big as, in, as you need to go. Um, so again, where does it exist? Then accountability, what can be expected of this? And make it really simple, because this is how we're going to be able to scale our organizations. When people show up, they're going to look at the roles and circles, and they're going to say, okay, why does it exist? What can I expect of this circle and role? So then you know who to talk to or what circles to engage when you want to achieve your purpose and do work, right? So this is what's going to help you as an organization scale complexity um, by making this really simple. And domain, what does it exclusively control? So if you have one circle that's doing storytelling and they own the website, then you say that and you need to state it. So then if any changes need to be made to the website, you know who to talk to in order to make changes to this you know, particular piece. So anything that exists within your organization where one person or group or anything can make changes to it, you want that to exist somewhere. A role or a circle needs to own it. And then any assignments. So this is the people. So you can see people are different from roles. So this little white thing we'll call it a role or yellow thing rather. This is a human that's inside that role. Multiple humans can be in one role, right? So the human is not the role. So the role and the circle are owned by the organization. This is the boundaries that they have. And then if you wanna make changes to this, this is an organization process to evolve what the organization looks like. So when we're building decentralized organizations, this means that new humans should be able to flow through your organization pretty easily without the organization structure collapsing. And this would work if the role is what's holding the power. The role has the accountability. Then it's just a matter of, you know, is that role filled or not? And if it's filled by a qualified person, right? Anyway, so that's pretty complex, but that's the simple organizing structure that we use within the, the tool sets that we're using to organize, i.e. the hyphen. Um, we have three different heartbeats is what we call them, but this is what the definition of do is, is, you know, decentralized for governance, H for the human, O for the operation. So these are three different spaces that exist within each circle. So one that's focusing on the humans, like how are we regenerating? How are we getting better? How are we increasing our capacity? It's the human stuff. Um, D is for governance. This is how we decide how we decide. So when I talked about, you know, the roles and circles, this is us changing what those mean, like how we come together to coordinate. 
So this whole process of creating a game guide, for example, exists in the governance space. And then there's the operational space, which is getting stuff done, the day to day. So this is you actually building your project, you know, feeding people, building houses, whatever it is you're doing, this all exists in the operational space. So this is then identifying these three spaces where purpose is manifested through. Um, you don't have to have all three, you know, you can try to forget the human, but I feel like if you forget any one of these three, that there's probably going to be problems, right? So it's very clear about having all three, and then you have unique spaces for them. So what we find is that things can be incredibly inefficient if you're trying to get operational work done, but people are talking about governance stuff. Then, you know, that causes tension in a lot of people because some people are like, hey, you know, I'm here to get stuff done. I'm here to do operations. And everyone's just talking about how they decide how they decide and building the structure. And, you know, I don't feel like we're getting, you know, making progress. So if you're really clear on what the spaces mean, then you're going to be able to have more effective groups or more effective engagement because people are agreeing to show up for that. The same tension we see when people want to come together again to get stuff done, but then we're just talking about the human stuff, you know, emotions and, you know, I don't want to deal with all that. Like, you know, you get kind of that feeling because they weren't, there wasn't an agreement and that's fair because people thought they were showing up for operations, but really, you know, it's a human thing going on. So if you make these things explicit, which is really all we're trying to do here across the board is make our structures explicit so that people understand what's going on. They know what they're agreeing to and you know we can play well together all right so this is talking about the structures that your organization might have you can copy these edit remix etc right um circle operations so this talks about what circles are expected to do so circles are expected to list metrics so what they're trying to actually accomplish their strategy for how they're going to go about accomplishing that and then what they're actually doing so we work within region civics on a seasonal level. So every season we start off by saying, what did you do last season? You know, the circle out comes from the season before, you know, what are you tracking and where are we headed next season? So every circle is expected to bring these things to the organization in order for it to move forward. So again, this is an agreement, right? Um, how voice works. We give voice directly to participations for contributing. So we're a contributor governed organization. The more you contribute, the more voice you get, so that we're governed by people who contribute the most. Okay, so Region Civics is governed by the R voice token, and this explains kind of the R voice token. Okay, now we get into what the token actually does. So what requires a vote? Not everything in your organization probably is gonna require a vote. In fact, that would be incredibly inefficient and people would probably get angry and that's not the way, <laughs> but that probably wouldn't work. You know, so we actually identify what requires a vote. So if you're distributing organization resources, that requires a vote. So if you're going to pay for something, you know, we have a common pool of resources. If we're going to pay out things, that requires a vote. Oops, let's come back here. Sorry. Um, changing the governance. So actually updating roles. Here, I can make this a slideshow for you guys. Uh, changing the governance, actually updating the roles, updating the circles, adding new policies, updating badges, all of that stuff would require a vote because it's changing the game and how the game works. Um, then changing the game guide. So literally changing these agreements we're making. So if we're coming together to change these agreements, that requires a vote. And changing the smart contracts. So how things actually work within the, on the technical side of things, that will also require a vote. So what does not require a vote is the day-to-day -day strategic work and decisions. So how circles decide what they're actually going to do and how they're going to fulfill their purpose, they don't need to put up a vote for that. If the organization is entrusting them through voting in their roles, then they're then being empowered to just act and do what they need to do in their roles capacity. They don't need to constantly make new proposals and ask the whole community, you know, how to move forward. That would be a very strenuous way of operating. And we found that and we immediately, you know, got rid of that idea. But you as an organization can choose otherwise. You can say, nope, you know, we're going to make votes for everything because we want a consensus based organization and we really want to make sure everyone's aligned with everything that we're doing. Then you can expand or contract what requires a vote in your organization. And this is where you're gonna make that all explicit. So again, you don't have to copy region civics, but here's a, an outline. And then we say the vote mechanics, how they work. So if you are a consensus organization, meaning you want 100% of people to commit and say yes to something, then you're gonna have both of these at 100. If you're gonna have a consent organization, where as long as someone doesn't block it, you're gonna pass forward, then you can have unity at 100. Everyone has to be for it, but quorum doesn't have to be 100. Maybe only 30% of the organization needs to show up and actually support it. But these knobs is what you're going to tweak then for how you make decisions in your organization. 
Um, we're going to start Oz off at 90%. So it's not quite consensus. Um, it's kind of it. You're getting pretty freaking close, but you can have a couple detractors try to block it. But you, you know, you're going to take more than 10% to stop something. Um, and then 30% core. And these are tweakable. So we're going to learn what works, what doesn't, and we're going to be able to move these around. So that's a, a proposed starting for region civics. Again, every one of your projects, you can identify how you make decisions here. Vote scope. I don't know why I went back out, but I'm just running with it. You know, where do votes affect change? So if it's a whole organization vote, it's going to affect the whole organization. But we also let circles decide how they want to do governance. So within one circle, they might say we're using consent and we're going to use it for these types of decisions. So that means every circle could actually have what requires a vote and, sorry, the mechanics. Yeah, so every circle will be able to have their own unique slide that looks like this. This is how do they make decisions within their circle? So that's the power we're giving those circles within the whole organization. Um, lamp lighters. So this is also something that's a structural necessity for Regen Civic. So this is one role that connects every circle to the anchor. So the anchor is the main circle that everyone's coming together that you can kind of coordinate as a whole organization. And then it's got a representative from every circle. And these representatives are actually accountable for that circle's success. It says what they're accountable for here. So that we actually have a role in a person who's currently filling that role to look to, to say what's going on in that circle. So this is gonna help us operate a little bit more effectively. We talk about tensions, a little bit of how we process them. We talk about seasons and how we organize. So seasons is the pattern of how we come together each season to launch a new season and what that looks like. Um, we're not entirely in this flow yet. We're kind of still getting started on it, but this is essentially what it looks like. And you can talk about your coordinating pattern within your project as well. And then this is one final slide for the token. How does your token work? What is your token's name called? Um, why are people buying it? I think it's going to be very different from the region civics one because each one of the projects, it sounds like they're going to be land back tokens. So that's when you're going to express it here. You know, maybe your token is you need to burn this token for every day you're staying at the project um, or whatever it is. This is where you're going to define the mechanics of how your token works and maybe make a video for it as well. Um, so right, this is kind of the game guide. So then people could show up to this, walk through this and get a basic understanding of how to contribute to region civics, right? And how to contribute to your project. So I'm gonna pause here in case there's any questions, if you feel like I've missed anything or if anything was superfluous or any type of feedback on this guide itself you think might be helpful for the group. Um, any clarifying questions or anything like that at all. We have a discussion space now we can step into. I, I, I have a sort of a simple question. You talk about compensation a lot. So like for Finca Sagrada, we'll create our own token and that'll be within Finca Sagrada it has no, no dollar value, right? Or, or, or are we selling tokens? I, I'm not sure how that whole compensation part works. You're not sure because it's still meant for you to co-create. So I've intentionally not been, you know, dogmatic of how groups ought to create their token. But how I can recommend right now that projects create their token is have it as a compensation mechanism so that we can more effectively compensate people fully. So if your project doesn't have enough fiat money, you know, dollars in the bank or Bitcoin in your account or whatever it is you're using to pay people on a day-to-day -day basis, if you don't have enough of that, Instead of just telling people to take risks or, you know, whatever, and promise them a future of something better, which is what most startups do today, they underpay and promise that things are going to work out. We're saying instead, we're going to make your compensation whole at any moment. But in this case, we're going to be giving you tokens that represent equity in the project itself. So that way, ownership of the project or those people who have contributed without getting paid up front, that's how we're, you know, issuing stake and equity in the company opposed to the traditional startup route, which is the founder founds it, they own 100%. New people come in and they make negotiations on how much percent the new person's gonna own. And it's really negotiation tactics that really dictate how much of a percentage of the company you're gonna get. And then that's who owns the company and that kind of unfolds from there. Here we say instead, all the contributions that come in, we're gonna recognize them by minting tokens 
and then sending that back out. How this also looks is then you're tracking all the value that your organization captured. So if you made 100 tokens because someone did $100 worth of contributing to your project, then what you're also signaling out when you issue those tokens is we're worth $100. We've captured $100 of contributions, so we're worth that much. So you're having a more grounded way of saying what your project's value is as well. How this really looks is, you know, your project has $100 million worth of land. So you're going to start off with 100 million tokens, and you're going to give that to whoever gave the land to the project, or maybe lots of people or whatever it is. So you own $100 million worth of land, you have 100 million tokens in your account that have been created and issued, right? So it's very simple. We're saying we're worth 100 million, we have 100 million tokens. Then someone shows up and does $10,000 worth of contributing. Maybe they made a really you know, important video you think is worth $10,000. Good. Now the asset of a video has been created. And now there's 100 million plus 10,000, 100 million, 10,000, you guys get it, tokens that are in existence. And you keep doing this process. And this is how you create tokens and you issue them out for people contributing to the project. That's one way of doing it. Um, but there could be a million ways that you guys issue tokens and create them and you know, make value behind them. Hopefully that's not too confusing. I tried to condense that down. But if you want the more drawn out explanation of that, uh, the video, How to Do a Do, explains it you know, a little bit more fully, which I'll share in, to the channel right here. Um, did that answer your question at all, Walter? Or did I just make it way more complex? Uh, yeah, I understand the process, but how if, if somebody then, say somebody comes for a year and they, they have uh, 10,000 tokens, how can they cash them out somehow? So each project is also going to have to create liquidity for itself in order to quote cash out. So in order for a cash out option to exist, it needs to have some exchange where they can either be swapped for fiat money or swapped for whatever way you want to quote cash out. Um, that's up to each project to establish. What Seeds is doing is helping establish it for Seeds and creating a pathway there. So if Seeds as a whole economy is working on doing the fiat bit to Seeds, which is what Seeds could do, then each project just focuses on doing it between Seeds. But that's just with seeds. So we're creating partnerships with other ecosystems. We'd like to have there be pools between, you know, Gitcoin and Ethereum and other tokens, right? And then those would be pathways for people to come in and out of your project through one of those other tokens. So right. we'll be creating a, a uh, Velka coin worth a dollar. Could we, is there a way we can connect Vinca Sagrada coins to that? And then they could go exactly. to Vinca. And that's exactly what we'll do. And uh, I think it would be very valuable. And I assumed it was going to be part of this anyway. Well, we're going to literally go through that process. So once we've created our projects and we've created our tokens, the ongoing step six or chapter six, which is co-creating a regenerative economy, is going to be us taking our tokens, doing token swaps with each other so that we're all co-invested into each other, bringing our tokens and putting them on exchanges, um, creating indexes with our tokens. So. If, you know, people can buy into region civics and they own a part of all of our projects and we can invest into each other. And there's a whole bunch of really cool stuff we're going to start doing with the tokens to, you know, bring more value to them. Um, but that's all going to come after we make sure we have a solid foundation for that token, which is creating our organization structure. So I know I kind of, you know, I'm doing the cart in the right order, <laughs> which is maybe annoying. Um, but I really wanted to make sure we had our structures effectively designed first before we build the tokens on top of them and we start getting people invested. Because if people do start getting invested, then that's when you know emotions start running higher and things start getting a little bit more complicated. And if our structures aren't designed before that, then we could fail and be part of, again, that 90% of projects that do fail. We don't want to be part of that 90%, so we're doing things a little bit slower, a little bit more grounded and more effectively. Uh, that does mean it's going to take more time before we have tokens you know, floating around and doing stuff. But by the time we do have that, the story will be sound, the structure will be complete, and you know, and then that's the way I want to, you know, present a token anyway. Otherwise, it's just way too risky and you run the chance of someone getting mad at you down the road because they bought something that crashed or whatever. <laughs> you know, we don't want that. Um, anyway, it's a lot of my opinions on it, but did that help, Walter? Yeah, yeah. I, I can see there's a lot of potential, future potential. So I'm excited about that. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, Tucker. And then Tina. So I had a question. So I, we, um, Tioga as a community, we made a, we had a meeting last night and we kind of chose a lot of our different circles and roles. And then 
This morning we had a discussion about our salary bands and we sort of based our model off of how Haifa did it by awarding the different roles um, compensation with voice tokens, with equity tokens and with like US dollars or whatever our currency will be. And what since we're going off of like more of like a, a revenue or profit share model, uh, what we ended up doing was doing like the big rock exercise for the different circles to like figure out the different percentages of the profit share and where that will be allocated. And so my question is, does the Haifa do tool have the tools in place for that revenue split mechanism to be realized? Not yet. That has been on our docket of things to build for like two years, it feels like. Um, but right now, no, they aren't building it. We're working with bugs and making sure that the current tools work effectively. So I'd recommend just using an Excel sheet, which we have a template that I offered, along with that big rock one. Either one of those templates work um, for doing that manually until we can build it right into the do. And that's also what I recommend is the do tools might lag behind what you're doing or may never reach what you're doing. So just use an Excel sheet in the meantime um, to kind of, you know, complement what you're working on. So don't let the, the lack of the tools prevent you from doing what you want to do in that sense. Right on. Thank you. Um, Tina. I'd love to uh are you documenting your process there tucker because i'd love to peek in on that meeting that's beautiful and then i just wanted to offer i don't know some of my imaginations around the tokenization because so much of what our land-based projects are involved with are things that have to do with carbon carbon and water uh sequestration and so um part of the way i'm looking at the coin is actually doing it through data so the garden itself is also uh earning the coins that end up bringing revenue so like get uh making sure that i'm uh getting data on like what kind of uh restoration um effects are actually happening and then using that as a way to kind of even translate into carbon credits so we can um work with things like that um in addition to fiat so i just wanted to offer that as a way to look at coins not just in contributions but also in the way the gardens are functioning towards uh regeneration Although you could also look at that as a contribution the garden's making to the project. So in reality, it is still a contribution token. It's just now we're seeing the totality of the contributions happening, which is what I really invite is, you know, the contribution token is based on the, the ecosystem law, the law of reciprocity, meaning in everything, there's an equal energy exchange, even if you don't notice it up front. But everything has an equal energy exchange if there's going to be balance. So that's what you want to do is if people are contributing energy to your project, you want to reciprocate that in some way. Otherwise, you're going to have disparities and inequalities. Unless that's what you want to create, in which case, of course, do that. There's no problems there. It's just if you are trying to create an equitable environment, then this is one way of doing it. Um, awesome. Thanks for sharing that, Tina. And I would love once we start forming our guides between each one of the projects to start having more um, project showcase and share what your guide looks like and what you've come to with these models. Um, any other thoughts or questions? Then I'll steal it for just a second. So the thing I shared here, here's another template that you can use. Um, so I highly recommend this before you even go into a do itself and codify anything, this is where you get to mess with it. So come copy this and this could have the salary bands and you get to play with these. You can set the dollar value for your token, what you want it to start at. Um, how many tokens are earned for every time you contribute a dollar worth of value, you can set that right here. Then you can go down and you can add all the different contributors. Let's see here, let's make this smaller. A little bit better. Then you can go down here and add all the different contributors to your project. And you can put what salary band you want them to be at, what percent full time they're contributing for each month. And you can start tracking contributions historically, really, as you can go back into history and do this, and then start doing this going forward. And using this Excel sheet, then you're going to be able to edit things really easy. And you can see how things fall. You can see what percent of ownership of the whole thing each one of the contributors have. So you can see how your protocols actually worked before you build them into the do itself. So I highly recommend taking this Excel sheet and move it around. 
Um, so you can have two different places, one for the capital investors and one for the time contributors. So people who are investing and you can give different multiples too. So in one point, some groups were wanting to give a different multiplier for people coming in with cash saying, okay, if you're com coming with cash, the whole entire contribution comes right now, where if someone's giving time, then it's coming over a period of time. And maybe there's more risk giving cash or whatever it is. You can say that if you're giving cash, we're gonna give a multiplier. But simultaneously, we want you to have less voice. So if you're gonna get more equity, then you're gonna get less governance decisions or whatever. And this is also letting you be able to manipulate that. So it's an Excel sheet that lets you come through and kind of design who would own how much of your token of your project before we bring this into our DAOs, right? Um, if you have any questions on this sheet, again, just ask in the Discord. The other thing is what you talked about, um, Tucker, with doing a how much or kind of a big rock exercise. And this is what this is, is this is one for quests. If you're contributing right now, you can use this that if you have $100,000 in your project right now and you're going to pay all of that out next season, where is that going to go? And then you can have everyone put in their name and where they think it should go. So the name of where they think it should go, what percentages, and then it's going to give an average. It's going to say if there's a standard deviation, which is going to run a flag. If there's a huge discrepancy in where people think money should go, maybe someone's being too self-serving and they're putting 100% of the budget to themselves or something like that. So that's going to flag those types of things. Um, it's going to give you an average. And then if that's what you're running off of, great. Then this is going to be able to spit that out for you and let you know how to distribute funds uh, we definitely want to use this for circles going forward. So that's a plan that Haifa has, is to be able to use this concept and model to be able to have the community as a whole, you know, crowdsource where to spend funds in the given season. So what circles get what percentage of the funding, which is what Tucker was talking about. This is a tool to be able to do that. Um, this will sort itself out too once these are actually all each equal 100. So that's letting you know it doesn't. So anyway, here's an Excel sheet that helps you do some of these things and simplify that process. So I know this is really complex sounding, um, but this is answering some of those big questions. You know, who owns what percent of our organization? And then I highly recommend, because all of your projects have existed already, you know, to start this process off by going into the history. So saying, okay, well, Walter, you've been at the project for five years. Like we're going to have to account for that. What Haifa did is we just gave a salary and a time percentage. So we said, okay, you've been at the project for the last three years and you've been doing 50% full time roughly, and we're going to give you a salary of 180,000. So that means for each year is $90,000 worth of contributions times that by three. Okay, that's what you start with. So that was our equitable way of starting it, just valuing people's time of how much they've contributed to the project up to that date where it launched, because that's the same protocol that we're using going forward by tracking people's time and giving them tokens for how much they're contributing. Um, or you can have a different way where you've just agreed that, hey, you know, John has done $100 million worth of value, so we're going to give him that, or we're just going to give him 100% of the tokens. This Excel sheet lets you actually type all of that out, put people's names, start playing with that, um, and grounding what those numbers are going to look like in your community. And this foundation is necessary because this is what we're building on top of. So the very first policy proposal in your DAOs will be the proposal, one, solidifying your game guide, but then two, also issuing the first tokens to all the contributors. So none of your projects are brand new. All of your projects are, ought to be issuing tokens out to you know, existing contributors. And this is the, you know, the process of doing that. I know that was a lot. Again, I keep doing that, but whatever. We're just going to make that a, a cultural thing we do here. Um, Lauren, you have your hand up. And if you have any questions or anything to that, just put your hand up and I'll call on you. Great, thank you, Reiki. Um, yeah, my question is um, to what extent you or others in the group can help us um, really expand our consciousness about this whole tokenization process. So I'm working with Walter and Susan and the team at Finca Sagrada. And we've got a, you know the, the different spheres of influence, the different circles comes into play here. But from their perspective, they're looking at, you know, they own the farm hundred percent, you know, and then they've got some investors, but, but now we're, we're getting ready to create new value. It doesn't exist yet. We're getting ready to think about, okay, what could we be doing for an energy exchange and how, how do we want to be setting that up so that more people can engage and participate? It doesn't exist yet. So 
I, I welcome ideas of people in terms of building in those agreements, building in that infrastructure in the DAO. Um, any ideas to help us stretch our, our minds into wrapping our brains around that? Does that make sense? Um, yes, and we want to create a plurality of approaches to this. However, one approach to this is what I would recommend, just based on my knowledge of what we have today, is first step, issue all of those tokens to Walter and Susan. If they own 100% of the farm, put a literal dollar value on that and match it with tokens, and then they own 100% or 98% or whatever it is. And then go through history, and Lauren, you've been contributing a lot, literally put a dollar value to those contributions and issue you tokens. So what we're doing with the first round of token issues isn't what we want it to be, it's what it is today. And a lot of projects are going to look centralized because the reality is, is they've all been centralized up till now. A lot of you have taken on a lot more risks than other contributors of your projects have or will in the future. So let's just make that explicit and honest today, and that's totally fine. And then that's what we're bringing to the crowd pooling event. And the crowd pooling event is going to be that one big moment where then people show up with new energy to fill roles. And that's when a lot of new tokens will start being issued. So it's the same thing with Haifa. You know, Haifa started off with seven people owning, you know, 90% of the organization. But then it's taken three years now. And now, you know, no one's over 20%. When before, some people were at like 40%. And now the average is way lower. So that's what it's going to look like in every project. It's going to decentralize over time. Because that's the truth. The truth is, is that there's, you know, a lot of people have, or a small number of people have contributed a lot to these projects to start with. So it's kind of a lie to make it look decentralized from the beginning when that's not really the, the truth of the project, right? Um, I say that because some projects do that. They say, well, we want to be decentralized, so we need to look decentralized right now. So, you know, even though Walter and Susan, you guys have put way more into this, we're going to start it off that everyone's got an equal say and an equal share in this. Um, but that wouldn't be fair to Walter or Susan for what they've actually done, right? So what we're trying to do here is create fair systems that actually, you know, track the value that these projects have. Um, so that's what I'd recommend is starting off with what the reality is and then opening up all those roles and new ways to contribute. So as those contributions come in, you're issuing tokens at that moment. When people are actually contributing is when they start earning the tokens, not based on promises of contributions and none of that stuff. Um, cause that's also another big problem, you know, in startups today, since there's a lot of legal work and issuing new equity, they do that one time. They don't want to like burden themselves. So a lot of the time that equity is issued at the point of negotiation. So it's not of how much value they actually brought to the project It's more on the negotiation skills. And we can get lost in that if we don't have some other protocol that we're using. So if your protocol isn't a contribution accounting token, that's fine, but have an explicit protocol that it is so that your project doesn't get lost in, you know, just negotiation for who owns what. And then it just really becomes kind of a battle of the egos and that's no fun um, in my opinions. So anyway, I, was that helpful or? Yes, thank you. And also, if you should go to the Discord, we have a section for this or co-creation. Come to this channel and ask any questions about designing your organization, and we can continue to talk about it throughout this week, or the weeks, rather. So I'll share all the spreadsheets and documents here that I've been talking about, and we can come in there and discuss it, ask any questions, and we keep designing this, of course. Um, Tucker. So uh, I have a question about the, the Hypha DAO tool again. So our project is kind of uh, in a similar spot as Finca Sagrada, where we currently have like one person who owns the property and we're trying to transition it into like more equal ownership and, and stuff of that nature. So my question is, um, is there a tool or, or a metric in the, the Haifa DAO tool that would allow us to issue like a, a whole bunch of equity tokens for the initial owner currently and then provide the opportunity for new members that are buying into the community to buy equity tokens from that initial owner so that they can get their equity out. Yeah, um, you don't even need the hyper tools for this. This is really simple. Um, if they have those tokens, they're in their account, they have them in their wallet, then they just work one-on-one -on -one with the other person. The other person sends them $10,000 to their bank account, they send them 10,000 tokens to their wallet. So. You don't need any specialized tooling beyond what's already available to do that. 
And could, could we also do that in a similar way with like a, a shared community treasury where like the community treasury begins to like slowly buy equity tokens off of the original owner so that they can get their equity out that way? Yeah, I, absolutely. I see zero reason right. why we can do that. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I figured. I just thought I'd ask. And how I would generally run that is it would just be a buyback and burn. Um, so there's really no reason for the organization itself to own liquid tokens. Unless, of course, you have a cap. So there's two different ways of doing this, and this is a big thing to decide at the beginning of your project. And I'll try to simplify this. Is one, you have a cap for the number of tokens that will ever be created. You create that amount from the beginning, and then you pull them into treasuries. So again, this is a relic of it being a lot of legal work to issue and distribute new shares. So startups generally went about a process of saying, hey, we're gonna have 100 million shares and we're gonna put them all into these other pools and this is where the initial distribution is gonna look. That was also good for investors because they wanted to know what percentage of the whole enterprise they're gonna own and be able to own indefinitely. So if there's only ever gonna be a million and you own 100,000, then you know at any point in time, you're gonna own 10% of this thing. So that is one way of doing it. Um, I don't recommend that way, which is why I don't ever talk about it, but you can do it that way. And again, some investors prefer and require that way. So some projects, depending on who you want to invest in your project, you might have to do this because that's what they expect. Or there's the other way, which is the contribution accounting, which is the project starts off with zero tokens and it creates and mints them into existence when contributions come to the project. And this way, your cap is indefinite. You can you know, theoretically have an infinite, infinite contributions to your project, right? So you can have an infinite number of tokens. Some people think that's scary because they're like, oh, well, we can be liquidated out of all of our value. You know, I'm not going to be able to own 10% indefinitely. And that's why we call it regenerative is because if someone can own 10% of an enterprise indefinitely, then that's concentrating wealth. Because if that project is just getting bigger and bigger, you know, that's why we have the super billionaires we have today, because they own X percent of this enterprise, because it's not equitably actually showing, you know, distributing value to the people bringing value. So it tends to concentrate, which is, just, you know, something that investors are looking for. They're looking for massive returns sometimes, right? So again, that's why some investors might require that, because that's an expectation that there is going to be that wealth accumulation point if it's successful. But if your project doesn't want to have that wealth accumulation point, then you might create a different tokenomics. So anyway, that's the first question you're going to have to add. So with your tokenomics is if it's going to be a cap, a fixed number of tokens that are going to exist indefinitely, or if it's going to have a, a different type of ceiling. And to complicate this a little bit more, you can have both. You could say that we're going to start with zero and do the contribution accounting but we're only gonna do that up into you know, X number of tokens. So that's kind of the middle ground is you can offer both of those things so that there isn't an infinite ceiling. Um, so that investors can look at it and be like, okay, well, I own 10% now, but if it reaches that cap, then I own 3%. So I know I'm only gonna be liquidated at 3X, right? And that's kind of that middle ground that I feel like has worked um, for all the various interests. Um, so anyway, you can pick either one of those routes or the middle ground that's up to you as a project, but I do think it's one of the first things you decide because it's going to you know, dictate how you pitch this to investors and how you design your contribution accounting. Because if you have your maximum that you're ever going to create created at the beginning, then you have to say how much is going to be in our community pool. <coughs> and we only have those number of tokens to pay out for contributions. So it causes you to also be a little bit more mindful of how you're paying out your contributions because now you have a finite supply to pay out, right? And then how that would work is that you're intending that by the time you run out of those tokens to compensate people with, that now you have a treasury of dollars, bitcoins, euro, or whatever to then pay people out. So that generally you might set that treasury up and say, hey, we're giving ourselves a five-year runway before we have to pay everyone in you know, fiat up front and we're not paying in tokens anymore. And then you give yourself enough tokens to give yourself a runway for five years or whatever it is. So uh, that was a lot. So I'll just recap again. One way is to set a maximum. Say we're going to only have 100 million tokens. And then of those 100 million, we're going to give 20 million to the landowner. We're going to give 50 million to our community pool or whatever. You decide your you know, distributions up front. Okay. And then you want to have those distributions be enough to get you until you're financially sustainable yourself. 
The other route is we say we're going to issue tokens indefinitely for contributions that we couldn't pay up front. So that maybe you're paying a mixture of the dollars that you've raised in euros or whatever, and these tokens so that you're fully compensating people indefinitely. And then maybe you don't have a cap because you're going to say we can do this infinitely, or you set a cap and maybe you set it really high or whatever you set it at. So anyway, that's kind of the two routes, mint them all up front or mint zero up front or anywhere in between. Is that helpful? Mm -hmm. um, Walters and then Anders. Um, most of the work we do adds no value. Like we have six volunteers. They spend their time growing food and preparing the food and then they eat what they grew. So, you know, and a lot of farm work really doesn't add value. You know, we, we have a sacred fire that we keep going. It takes work. And so um, when it doesn't add value, then, then do you have a recommendation? You don't give out uh, tokens oh or what? I would say everything adds value, but, but here's how all the things need to be circular. If they're adding value by growing food, then they're consuming value by consuming food. So they would get paid tokens for making the food and then they would burn their tokens for eating the food. And if they're growing what they ate, then they're at zero, right? So you can have that as a community, or you can say, no, if you're consuming what you grow, then that's not you know, a value exchange we even wanna track at all. And you just choose to not have that. In which case, then those members aren't in roles. But you know, so that's up to you to decide. Um, but yeah, if there's a consumable, make sure your token's being consumed. And that's what the day stay rate to consume your token model comes from, is that if someone's contributing to the community, but they're also staying there, then they're adding value for contributing there, but they're consuming value for staying there. So they earn tokens for staying there, then they burn those tokens for having stayed there. I'm sorry, they earn tokens for contributing, and then they burn tokens for staying there. So that's where the balance on each side of this is going to be. So you're issuing tokens for a contribution that wasn't tracked or paid for cash or whatever ways you might've paid them. And then you burn those tokens when things are consumed at your project. I would okay. find an interesting way of tracking the spiritual value being you know, built for that sacred fire. And there'd be a way of you know, tracking that. Maybe we wanna get weird and complex and find a way of consuming spiritual energy, but probably not. And that's probably not even a thing. Um, anyway. Point is that's kind of the balancing act of the token is you're minting them for contributions that have not been paid otherwise and then you're burning them when things are consumed um or to do buybacks and things like that if you want to do that um anders wait walter did that answer your question yeah that's good yeah yeah and uh before i ask my question i'll piggyback a little bit on uh, on walter um and so our current um volunteer program is is kind of functions like a universal base income in the sense that you know the income that people receive is the exchange that they get to receive through being part of the collective that we're creating and there's like a minimum request that these volunteers offer and for that request they get food they get stay they get all of these things which has value all of the and the experience that we create like has value now what we want to do with the tokens and you know we might do this differently after i've reviewed some of these videos i'm sorry if i'm you know repeating something that's already been covered but um when people offer extra help in those realms that's when we would offer them like more tokens or if they are working on a project that is specifically designed to stay long term like if they're building new beds in the garden if they're building new infrastructure if they're doing these new things now people have a different level of motivation to support these different things because they're offering long-term value and for that long-term value they would get you know some other additional type of like benefit because other people are going to be receiving long-term value from that specific um, activity um, my, my question that I have is, and if you've covered this before, I'll review the video, I apologize, but what have you considered with regard to like SEC regulations and these different things as we start like attaching, you know, like land values and things like that to these different tokens to not get in, get ourselves into like a mess? Yeah, I am not a lawyer. Don't reference anything I say and everything I say is a lie and false. So I'm putting that on the record. However, 
So when we're issuing these tokens, it's the same thing with doing a startup. If you know everyone, then you're outside of the SEC's purview. When you start having an open sale, so maybe you put it on a website and start marketing it, that's when the SEC is going to give a cap about what you're doing. So if you're running everything through a do where you know the landowners, you know people who are contributing financially, and you're doing KYC by the fact that you do know your customer, then you're fine. So do KYC and AML. So that's by knowing the people and making sure you're not you know, supporting terrorism and things like that, then you're fine. It's the same thing as raising friends and family money for a startup. The moment we take this to a crowd pooling event and start reaching out to people we don't know across the world and telling them to invest in our you know, equity backed tokens, that is when we're going to have to go through and do some regulations. And we will do that as a group. Or maybe we exclude the, you know, the US and we do what we need to do to make sure we're staying legally compliant. But that's something we'll do as a collective. Cool. And, and there's some other groups and organizations that have a bunch of different ways of working around this and all that stuff. So cool. And do the tools um, of which that you're recommending, do they include KYC um, you know, tools so that we can do that through that? Or do we have to use a third party um, software for that? Um, that's totally up to you to do. Ours and what I'm personally doing, again, not a lawyer, is you just have them say who they are in their proposal. So when you're making a cash contribution that goes through the DAO, one, you're going to have your account name. But two, that account's going to be associated with you, which makes sure it's actually you then you're going through that process, right? Um, so you actually just have them say who they are in their proposal when they say, hey, you know, I'm Joe, I'm giving $100,000 cash, so I want $100,000 or 100,000 tokens. That's in the proposal right there, it's stored on chain, we're going through that. So that's how we're, you know, operating this as the best of our understanding of how to navigate these rules. Um, and we're not openly marketing this yet, but when we do that, we're gonna have to do some other stuff as well when we come to that junction. Um, that's, I think, a whole chapter that we're going to get on right before crowd pooling is we'll go through. So after we set up our organization structures, we'll set up the legal containers around them. So that'll all be part of the next part of this season. Um, real quick, I'm just going to share some things and we got some more hands up and then we'll go over these. I'll share this as well. But you talked about the different forms that people are contributing. You're like, well, people are showing up and they're learning things. So they're doing a knowledge exchange. I highly recommend going through this and actually tracking the different forms of capital. And this is something we want to bring into the do tools itself, or maybe create one specifically for Regen Civics that looks at the forms of capital this way, so that we're tracking all the different ways that people are showing up to their project and already getting compensated. So like you said, if people are showing up and they're selling their time, but they're gaining knowledge, then maybe we even have tokens that represent that. And then you're tracking all of the knowledge tokens that you're earning for staying at your project. And this could be a lot of fun, you know? So then you're not paying financial. In this case, there's tokens as well. Let's add that in here and make it explicit. You know, you can have the financial model of tokens that you're compensating. But like you just pointed out, you're compensating with knowledge, right? So as long as we're making this explicit, then that's what we're really accomplishing here is we're tracking all the value flows and making sure that people are equitably rewarded. And you don't always have to be equitably rewarded in financial value, right? Some people are going to be happy being there because of the culture. And let, let's make that explicit, right? You know what that actually looks like? Well, we're going to have a lot of fun explaining that. And I have a hard stop in 10 minutes. I believe you all do too. So we're going to do quick with this. The other thing I highly recommend for projects, and I'll put this together in a video for Regen Villages, and it's my opinions on how we can launch a village to be regenerative. Then anyway, is to talk about two things, is that upfront capital contribution. So every member who's coming to your project is doing something upfront. So I highly recommend, actually, it doesn't matter. If you want to be a project of equals, this is something to do to set up at the very beginning, to set that standard that you're going to be equal in the future. So if someone comes in with 150K cash, maybe that's what your upfront capital contribution um, requirement is, is we say everyone has to come with 150K. Some can come with cash. Some's coming with, you know, a mixture of tokens. They have an expansive seed bank. They're knowledgeable in permaculture, and they're going to do 15 hours a week, at valued at this price, etc. So they came up with their 150k with a whole bunch of different ways outside of just money because they didn't have the money. This people actually came up with their 150k by giving 20 hectares of land that was worth 150k. So what you actually do is you set it up that everyone comes in equally even if they're only going to do that for 222 weeks into the future before it's actually equal for them. So you set a standard that everyone's going to contribute equally 
either now or into the future. And then you can, with your project, have a recurring contribution to say, this is what everyone needs to do to become an equal member, even if that equality is only reached in seven years or whatever. And then you're going to have a recurring contribution. Maybe you don't, maybe your project doesn't, but this is what you need to do and contribute to each week in order to maintain your membership. And maybe membership gives you food and housing and all your needs for life. Um, and you have to contribute. In this case, it's three hours a week. Um, sorry, I think it's eight hours a week that's being asked for, and this person's paying some. So they are only going to give three hours because they got a lot of money. So they're going to pay instead of work, right? And that's what you can have in your communities. You have a fixed amount of how much you need to have up front and how much you need each week, but then you use the various forms of capital in order for people to be able to pay that. And what's really cool here is then we can have a space for like removing poverty. And even people with no money at all, we can still have time and they can show up and earn their equal share in the community, right? Um, anyway, so that's a whole side show and we'll see William and then Roberto. Uh, okay, so it's funny timing because Stephen actually put his hand up first. He wanted to talk about the NFT bond funding and NFT uh, alternative to selling tokens and using NFTs as a way of recognizing contribution and value and how selling them on secondary markets therefore doesn't impact your organization token value. And, and we see like the, the old world stock markets going like this. We don't want that happening to our villages. Um, but he's just coming back from getting a charger. I also have something to say about the SEC regulation. I've been trying to get Haifa to kind of hear me on this for a long time. Um, because as a spiritual ministry or a private organization, a private membership association, every exchange between a member and another member is within the jurisdiction of private, or in this case, the, the universe spiritual ministry. And exchanges between members are outside of the SEC regulation. So all of the decentralized applications that we're building have a simple sign up that when you join the platform, when you become a user, you're joining the ministry or the private members of association, whatever that might be that you decide to use. Um, and therefore, all of, the, all of the transactions are happening within a different jurisdiction. So the SEC cannot regulate it. And I encourage Haifa to use it. I encourage anyone that's still worried about SEC to use it because we're not worried about it. And we've been operating for a few years this way and it's working. Um, but over to Stephen about NFT bond funding, if there's space for it, right? I know you're moderating. Um, I know we have five minutes today, and I want to get to Roberto's question if it's related more to the organization and the game guide itself, because I know the NFT bit is part of crowd pooling, and I think it fit perfectly in that season, along with the universe fitting perfectly in the next part chapter when we talk about legal structures. Um, so I think we'll give you a space to actually make a presentation more about how that structure works for projects that want to participate in that. Um, and then Steve and I want to give you a space specifically because the NFT thing is huge for us to unpack that when we get to the crowd pooling and we talk about the different forms of, you know, ways that we can raise fat capital. So anyway, that, that's an expansive topic there, but I feel like it needs more space in the right space. Um, uh, Roberto, I'll go over to you then. Thank you. Um, I just uh, want to bring up some uh, result of an experiment that we did over here. When we're talking about accounting, um, where, where do we draw the line? Because what happens is that in a community, what is nice is the gifting to each other, right? So, oh, I will cook for you, I will do this for you. And, and as a human organization, you create cohesion by organizing yourself. If you start to introduce tokens, what happened, what we saw happen is that people start to start to charge basically for different things. And actually the community cohesion seems to be a little bit less uh, strong. So I just wonder if you were having some thought about this, where, the, where do we draw the line? Um, where you draw the line, I don't know where. Do you draw the line? Absolutely. And it's the same reason of drawing a line with the vote scope. Where is a vote required versus not required and making that explicit? Uh, I would absolutely recommend doing the same thing. And it's glad you brought this up for you know, the tokens and where we bring the economy in. Because if we don't make it explicit, we're always gonna have creep. Because it's gonna happen in some communities, they're gonna show up and they're counting in their own mind. You know, Oh, I cleaned up the kitchen every week and Bob's never done it, I hate Bob. And you know, now all of these emotions are start forming because we're not making it explicit. 
you know, but if that was made explicit, then people will feel fair about it. Well, every time I clean up the kitchen, I earn a hundred tokens. So like, whatever, if Bob doesn't want to earn tokens, he's figuring out his own way of doing it, you know? And now all of a sudden we don't have to be mad at Bob because we don't need to account in our head because tokens are doing the accounting, you know? <laughs> so we've seen that has that capacity to offset some of that. But as you pointed out, if we go too far into that, then our whole lives are token-based and there's an exchange between every interaction. And maybe that's not what we want either. And I, I wouldn't want to live in that system. So absolutely draw the line and make it explicit where it exists. And you know, one principle exists here, which is 80-20. You know, try to capture like the 80% of the stuff that really matters, but then leave it at that. Don't try to go too far here. And if we can account for the big stuff, um, then I think people's minds, and at least my mind and other people, you know, would be more okay with the little discrepancies that might exist that might not make things perfectly fair, as long as things are, you know, mostly there. Um, so I don't know where to draw the line. I think we're going to discover that as we start living through this. But I definitely think that that's probably part of the guide now is when you talk about your token, have the scope of where this token matters. For example, if you're a contribution token and it's getting burnt for every day you stay there, then that's it. That's the scope of the token. You burn this token every day you stay there and you earn it for doing a bunch of different things for the community. That's where tokens matter and you know, gifting and all that is still going to exist. Cece's telling me that I have a hard stop right now. Uh, so I'll leave it if there's any other questions. Last one before we go for today. Mikey, we're already going to be late. I'm sorry, but can you please go? Never mind. My stop is right now. So I love you all. <laughs> and I'll leave it right here. And we'll Thank see you, you next week. Thanks, Mikey. Thank you. Bye-bye. See you next Thanks, time. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.